How many of you are patients here or caregivers of patients here? No? Well, oh, I'm sorry, could everyone hear me? How many people are patients here or caregivers of patients here at the Rubo Center? Oh, so most of you are from outside or at least not caregivers or patients. So um, we here deal with degenerative diseases of the brain. When there is an illness that's call it causing brain cells to die that results in changes in cognitive function but also changes in movement, balance, and other aspects of brain function. Um, but there are a lot of conditions that have the potential to interfere with brain function that are not necessarily degenerative in nature. Now, I had asked for a dancing bear. <laughs> and fireworks. He got the fireworks and the dancing bear. He told me he wasn't going to be able to deliver, but he actually did. That is outstanding. Please, please give a hand to Paul Alvarez. I thought you said we were going to have to go with a monkey. All right. So um, one of the important things that we want to think about is when we think about memory loss, what we are generally trying to do is find out what are all of the possible contributors to memory loss. Very often, uh, there's no just one single smoking gun or one silver bullet that explains why someone might have impaired cognition. So think of this more as a, a list of possible contributors to memory loss. And having one contributor or cause of memory loss doesn't necessarily mean that you're immune from others. So there are people who have more than one uh, problem going on. And sometimes you have to balance priorities, and we'll talk about this a little bit uh, down the road, but sometimes we find out that the cause or contributor of memory loss is something that is difficult or impossible sometimes for us to change. That comes up particularly when medications might be interfering with memory and thinking. Although I'm gonna be talking today mostly about reversible causes of memory loss, right? So things that are not degenerative in nature, things that are not brain diseases. I have to admit that most of the time when we see someone who's over age 65 with some kind of memory impairment, most of the time it does turn out to be from a degenerative cause. But again, remember that even if you have a degenerative cause, there may be other contributors to that. And we wanna make sure and optimize everything as much as possible so that the individual has the best quality of life and the best cognitive performance that they can have. And along the same lines, saying that uh, an illness is incurable or irreversible does not necessarily mean it's untreatable, right? So, for example, diabetes and high blood pressure. We haven't yet discovered a cure to either of those. We don't know how to reverse them, but you'd consider it very foolish of a doctor to say, well, these are incurable, so I'm not gonna give you blood pressure medicine or insulin, right? Uh, similar thing with memory loss. So even though people may have a degenerative process causing their memory loss, doesn't mean that we can't do something about it. Furthermore, it doesn't mean that we should not make sure that there isn't some other contributor to that memory loss. And then finally, even after saying all that, most of the time, if someone comes in with memory loss that looks like a degenerative condition, it is going to be a degenerative condition. So one of the uh, things we say in medicine is, if you hear hoofbeats, don't think zebras. Uh, well, unless you're in the Serengeti or something like that. But <laughs> in general, in Las Vegas, if you hear hoofbeats, um, it's probably gonna be a horse. It might be a zebra, but that's unlikely. Could you speak just a little bit louder? Yes. yes. Oh, Thank I, you. You know, I was told that I would need the microphone and I said I wouldn't. So. <laughs> Wrong again, just like with the dancing bear. Okay. So um, I made just sort of a diagram here of, the, of a lot of the, the contributors to memory loss. This is not completely exhaustive, but it sort of points out some of the more uh, important causes of memory loss. And on the blue side, on the left, those are things that are generally irreversible, things that once they start causing memory problems, we can't really get rid of them or stop them. And on the right are things that are generally reversible. Now you'll notice that some sort of fit into both circles, and to the extent they fit into both circles, that means that there's a degree to which 
once the damage starts, it can't always be reversed with those situations. So uh, the alcohol, for example, while people get cognitively impaired while they're intoxicated with alcohol, uh, people can get brain injury from alcohol. To some extent, if they stop drinking, that can improve, but there is permanent injury, permanent damage that can be done. And you might notice that I put uh, medication in that sort of middle range too, which might surprise some of you, but there's uh, information about that that I'll be telling you in a little bit. So uh, like I mentioned, we're going to be talking about reversible contributors to memory loss or to cognitive impairment, and I listed the ones we'll be talking about today. Uh, brain tumor and brain infection you know, are in that reversible category, but because those are both brain diseases, I'm going to leave those out today. We're going to be talking really about things that um, impose some kind of burden upon the brain as opposed to things that are, are sourced from the brain. So first, uh, depression and anxiety. And I bring this up first because depression and anxiety are both extremely common. Depression in a lifetime, about one out of six people, 15% of people, will experience an episode of depression. And about 7% 7 7 of people each year will experience an episode of depression. So, you know, uh, one out of 12, one out of 13 people or so uh, will have depression in this year. And depression does cause cognitive dysfunction. In fact, one of the criteria for diagnosing depression is impairment of concentration, difficulty with thinking, difficulty with decision making. Similarly with anxiety, also very common, occurs in more than 15% of people at some point during their lives. Um, and it's also associated with cognitive trouble. Um, some of the anxiety disorders include trouble with thinking as part of the, the diagnosis. Now one thing that's important is that we as providers are not very good at asking our patients about depression and or anxiety symptoms unless it's quite obvious you know someone is sitting there and starts crying or is trembling or has a panic attack in front of us uh, or unless the patient brings something up i think we're getting better in that we developed some screening tests a lot of doctors offices now do depression screening as a routine part of at least an annual evaluation but still I would say to those of you who are not providers here, don't necessarily rely on the provider to bring this topic up with you. But if you're noticing these symptoms, which we'll talk about, um, there are things that you do want to bring up with your provider, particularly if you're having memory loss. So depression is marked by a persistent feeling of either sad mood or inability to get pleasure from things that you used to enjoy. It is present most of the time on most days. And it has to be present for at least two weeks for a formal diagnosis to be made. And along with that, uh, people will usually have several of these other symptoms. Uh, trouble with sleep, reduced interest in things that they used to enjoy, uh, decrease in energy, uh, appetite change, either reduced appetite where they don't want to eat or foods that they used to like. Just aren't of interest or can sometimes be increased appetite. Uh, trouble with concentration or trouble with making decisions. Again, that's the cognitive part that comes in. And then when people do think, their thoughts tend to be different from how they used to be. They tend to be more negative. They tend to be so perhaps preoccupied with death, either their own death or thinking a lot about people that they've lost. They tend to think of themselves as worthless or tend to ruminate on things that they feel guilty about, inappropriately or not. And then often they'll have motor symptoms of feeling either excessively keyed up and jittery or slowed down like they're moving through mud. So um, if, if someone has even two or three of these symptoms, I think an exploration for whether depression might be the cause of memory loss is definitely in order. With anxiety, uh, similarly, this is uh, one of those things that you're likely going to have to mention to your doctor as opposed to your doctor being likely to bring it up with you. We are even worse at screening for depression than we are at screening for it, or even worse at screening for depression than we are at screening for anxiety. So like I mentioned, a lot of doctor's offices do now uh, screening tests for depression, but very few that I've seen, uh, including ours, we don't typically screen everyone for anxiety. 
and it's usually something we have to bring up on our own or the patient brings up. So people feel excessively nervous. They feel on edge. They feel like there is um, something worrying them. Sometimes it's excessive worry about something that would worry anybody, but their worry is way out of proportion to that. Or sometimes it's worry about nothing at all, just sort of what we call a free-floating anxiety, a sense of tension and worry during the day. Um, people with anxiety will, can also have trouble with sleep, muscle tension, uh, will feel very tired sometimes, and sometimes will have acute attacks of anxiety where they feel like they're in imminent danger. Heart racing, breathing fast, sweating, shaking. Um, irritability can also be a part of anxiety syndromes. So in addition to the direct <coughs> effects on concentration and thinking and decision making of both depression and anxiety, there are also these indirect effects on thinking, right? So if you have insomnia, if you're not sleeping well, you are less likely to think clearly than you are when, you, when you're sleeping well. And both of these cause problems with sleep. Um, sometimes people's appetite can be so poor that they're not eating. Again, something your brain needs is nutrition, and your brain won't work as well if you're not eating. And then the fatigue, the lack of energy that both of them cause can make someone mentally sluggish. Both of them also put a load on the brain. Your brain, as great an organ as it is, can only do so many things at one time. And when anxiety or depression is additionally burdening the brain, the amount that it's able to do in terms of its appropriate functions and goals is reduced. You know, if you think about it like um, a Ferrari, right? Ferrari's a great car, fast car, handles beautifully, but if you put a, an RV, hook an RV to the back of it, it's no longer going to act like a Ferrari. That doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the car. Just like confusion or memory loss in a brain with depression doesn't necessarily mean there's something wrong with the brain. It means the brain is being burdened in an unusual way or being held back by something that it's not supposed to be carrying. Um, so both of these, anxiety and depression, place an extra load on the brain that the brain is not naturally equipped to manage. Um, it is pretty clear, uh, repeatedly, tests and studies have shown that people with anxiety and depression really do have impaired memories and that the memory really does get better once the depression and anxiety are treated. And that's why it's very critical to treat them. But in addition, uh, there are studies showing that important memory structures in the brain, anybody heard of the hippocampus? It's kind of like the tape recorder in the brain. If stuff is going on in your environment, your hippocampus is keeping track of it and putting it in storage. Both anxiety disorders and depression have been shown to cause reversible hippocampal shrinkage. So someone with depression, their hippocampus will shrink, and as they recover from depression, their hippocampus will re-expand. It's not the same degree of shrinkage that we see in someone, say, with Alzheimer's disease and hippocampal shrinkage, but it does make it very clear that these illnesses have a direct effect on the brain's memory systems. So, you know, what everybody wants to know, of course, and people don't want to know just what's the problem, but what can be done about it. Um, fortunately for both of these, there's a variety of treatments, both uh, medical, where you, you, know, you have to have a medical provider, but even uh, non-medical treatments. So uh, counseling and medication are usually required in a provider's office, but exercise, meditation, and mindfulness, and changes in, one in, in one's environment. If there's something that's making you more anxious, try and remove it. I'm not suggesting divorce to anyone, that maybe you should do the counseling. Um, but, though, but there are ways to address these, and I would say the, the primary one that you want to pursue is exercise. Exercise has a number of beneficial effects on brain health, but has a direct effect also on both depression and anxiety, reducing those. So vitamin deficiencies also come up pretty frequently as problems that uh, result in cognitive impairment or worsen um, cognition. Uh, sort of classic and maybe the first uh, vitamin deficiency that we were aware of that impaired cognition was deficiency of thiamine or B1. Um, vitamin B1 is important in the metabolism of nerve cells. So their ability to utilize energy 
it requires vitamin B1. Um, and usually in the United States, we do not see a lot of people with thiamine deficiency anymore because uh, after discovering that B1 deficiency can cause cognitive and other neurological problems, we started fortifying a lot of foods with additional B1. So it's unusual these days to see thiamine deficiency, except in folks who drink a lot. And the reason there is not because the alcohol does something specific to thiamine, but because alcohol can reduce absorption of some of the nutrients. Also, people who drink a lot can get a lot of calories from alcohol and may neglect to eat because they're getting sufficient calories from what they're drinking, and therefore they're not getting the thiamine that's in the food. Um, and then medical illnesses. So someone who's, for example, in the hospital on IV hydration for a while and doesn't get additional supplements in there. Our hospitals are pretty good at that now, but someone who's ill at home, let's say, has some kind of stomach problem that when they eat, gives them abdominal pain or diarrhea or whatever, and so they refrain from eating or only eat a very limited um, group of foods, that person may become vitamin deficient. So in addition to causing kind of chronic long-term memory problems, thiamine deficiency can also cause um, an acute problem that's known as Wernicke syndrome because it affects, thiamine deficiency affects all of the brain cells. So people will get double vision because their eyes don't move right. It might be hard to see, but um, this gentleman in the picture here, each of these squares represents a different direction in which he's trying to look. So for example, the top left square is him trying to look up and to the left. And what you'll notice if you look at each of those pictures is that he's able to move his eyes inward, but he can't move them outward. So when he's trying to look to the left here, see how his left eye just stays right in the center, it doesn't move out. And when he's trying to look to the right, the right eye doesn't, or when he's trying to look in this direction, this eye doesn't move out. And when he's trying to look in that direction, the other eye doesn't move out. So that's one of the typical signs of Wernicke syndrome. They also will have a lot of trouble walking. So the sort of typical <coughs> story is that someone who's on alcohol comes into the emergency room because they're unable to walk, they're seeing double, um, and they turn out to have Wernicke syndrome. But a long-term consequence can be another syndrome called Korsakoff. It looks a lot like Alzheimer's disease. People aren't able to form new memories. Uh, they don't remember conversations. They, don't, they can't keep track of the date. The big difference is that if they stop drinking and you get them on thiamine, Unlike with Alzheimer's disease, they'll stabilize. And with Alzheimer's disease, as we know, it's, it's chronically progressive. But it's very important to recognize this, right? Because there's a huge difference in treatment. One person, you expect them to stabilize, and um, they need the thiamine. Another person, you'd put them on a dementia medication. And although that might slow down the symptoms, you would expect progression. Uh, vitamin B12 is another that we always check for or request the primary care doctor to check for. So vitamin B12 is mostly in um, animal products. Uh, so there's a lot in eggs, there's a lot in meat. Doesn't come a lot from plants. And so one of the areas where we are seeing B12 deficiencies now, if people aren't aware of this, is in people who are adopting vegan diets. So they don't eat any, that doesn't mean vegetarian, you know, someone who eats eggs and stuff like that is fine, but if you don't eat any animal products, then you have to get your B12 elsewhere, or a supplement or something. B12 has a complicated absorption system, and some people can get an immune disorder called pernicious anemia, where they can no longer absorb B12. So this kind of fools people because they figure, well, you're not gonna have a, if you're eating right, you shouldn't have any vitamin deficiencies. But with pernicious anemia, you can put as much B12 in your mouth as you want, including B12 supplements, but you may not absorb enough of it to sustain you, and you would actually need to get B12 injections. Um, and then people with gastrointestinal illnesses or surgery, because of this complicated absorption system, can sometimes lack B12. In addition to memory trouble, People with B12 deficiency often have fatigue, often have depression, will sometimes get tingling or numbness in their fingers and toes, and sometimes because this can affect the spinal cord, they'll have a lot of trouble walking. Now some of you who know people with various kinds of dementias might say, you know, that sounds an awful lot like uh, dementia that I've seen. Trouble with memory, some depression, some difficulty with walking. So again, that's why we always check for this because 
it's relatively common as vitamin deficiencies go in the United States and because it can really mimic or look like a lot of other dementias. In fact, when I see patients for memory disorders who are referred by a primary care physician, they almost always have had their vitamin, their thiamine and their B12 already checked because our primary care doctors know to look for that. Vitamin B3, similar to the other B vitamins, um, it, you get the deficiency typically if you are having some reason for not absorbing food well, either not taking the food in or because you have some kind of gastrointestinal problem or illness. Um, the symptoms of vitamin B3 deficiency are a little bit more dramatic, as you can see, as compared to B12 and B1. So there's this awful looking rash that people get, and very distinctive about the rash, or very distinctive about this is there's also, it also affects the tongue. The tongue will become painful, it gets red and swollen, sometimes there'll be in addition to the swelling white patches on it. So this is not something that is likely to be missed as a vitamin deficiency of some sort, but pinning down what the deficiency is is sometimes the difficulty. Um, and you know, it's always good to include pictures in a PowerPoint. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, hormone deficiencies now, the primary one, the big, the big player in this realm is thyroid hormone. So the thyroid produces this hormone that's sort of like uh, uh, an overall metabolic set of the body. The higher the amount of thyroid hormone, sort of the faster everything goes. And the lower the thyroid hormone, the things slow down. We used to see a lot of people with these kinds of growths in the neck that's uh, a goiter, and it's caused by lack of iodine. So if you've ever wondered, why, do they, why is my salt iodized? It's specifically to make sure that the thyroid works well. So again, Goiter is something we don't see a lot in the United States anymore. But we do see people who have thyroid nodules, cancerous or benign nodules, who have to get them surgically removed. And they therefore produce less thyroid hormone than they should. Um, the symptoms of thyroid deficiency, as you can imagine, because this is an overall hormone and through the whole body sort of sets the rate of activity through the whole body. <coughs> you can have a variety of effects, but a lot of people sort of categorize them as this slowing down. They feel tired, depressed, they get constipation, the heart rate even slows down, the skin gets puffy and dry. You can see this is a woman here who on the left has thyroid hormone deficiency. She has a pretty severe form, most people won't look like this, but you can see the puffiness of the skin, particularly under her eyes and around her, her cheeks. And then when she gets treated with the thyroid hormone, you can see that she almost looks like a different person, right? Mm -hmm. So in addition to all these symptoms, memory loss is also a symptom of thyroid deficiency. <clears throat> and then I talked a little bit about alcohol, but alcohol-related dementia is pretty common in the United States. It tends to be much more common in people under age 60 than in people over 60. We're not really sure why, except that most people who have problems with alcohol develop those problems in their teens, 20s, or 30s. So by the time they get to 60, you know, we're talking about 30 to 40 years of heavy alcohol use. And so you know, the disease strikes earlier than, uh, you know, say, Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of people ask, well, you say excessive alcohol use, well, what is excessive? Um, this is a bit controversial, but it does seem pretty clear that an average of more than 14 drinks per week is definitely a bad for you. Okay, so that averages out to two drinks per day. And that 14 drinks needs to be over at least three. So don't anyone go home and drink their 14 today and <laughs> say, all right, next Wednesday I can get some more. Um, it, binge drinking is particularly harmful to the brain. So people who are binge drinkers have a lot more likelihood of brain injury and brain deterioration than those who are not. It's important to know that alcohol-related dementia, the poisoning that alcohol does to the brain, may be progressive even after people stop drinking. That it may take on a life of its own where there is continuing reduction in, uh, in the brain's capacity. So this, is, uh, this was pretty dramatic. I found this picture of, on the left here, 
of the difference between a 43-year-old, a normal 43-year-old on the left, and a 43-year-old with a history of heavy alcohol use. The amount of brain shrinkage there is pretty remarkable. Just take my word for it, that is about what we'd see in a 75-year-old brain, or a normal 75-year-old brain. So uh, it can be, uh, the amount of damage that can be caused can be really tremendous. Oh, another important thing to point out, you don't get to choose the size of those two drinks per day. There's a specific, <laughs> specific, specific amount, one and a half ounces worth of alcohol. So don't like it. Oh, I'll use a bigger cup. No, that's not going to work. And then um, on the right there, it's a difference in brain activity. On the left is someone with a normal level of brain activity as represented by those somewhat hotter colors of the bright green and the yellow and the orange. And on the right is the brain activity of someone who is alcohol dependent. This is not while intoxicated, okay? So this is with no alcohol in their system. Still, these, these differences persist. Medications, that's a... Uh, big concern. I mean, a lot of us, if you think about the, the number of medications that we take compared to, say, what our, what our parents or grandparents took, we take a lot more of them, right? Um, medications have their benefits, otherwise we wouldn't be on them, I hope. Um, it's important to remember that each person has individual response to medication. So I'm going to talk about some medicines that increase the risk for cognitive impairment. That does not mean the risk is increased for you. It also does not mean that you should come off of that medicine, definitely. It just means you have to weigh the risk versus the benefits. There may be a benefit to the pain medication that you're taking. It may be contributing to cognitive impairment. What I'm trying to do is make sure you're aware of the risks so that you can properly weigh. I'm not forbidding any of these medications. In fact, I have patients who are on these medications. I have patients that I put on these medications because the benefit uh, weigh the risk because we monitor their cognition carefully. <coughs> there are certain whole classes of medications that cla carry a higher risk, and those are the ones I'm mainly going to talk about today. There are scattered medications here and there that are used for relatively unusual purposes that also carry risk. So this is not a complete list of every medication that could hurt your cognition. Um, and we want to also, I just want to clear up the differences between a side effect, a toxicity, and a withdrawal. A side effect is something that occurs at a typical dose of medication. It usually doesn't occur in most people, but can occur in some. We're talking mainly, in this case, about side effects. We are not going to be talking too much about toxicity. Toxicity is when someone takes an excess dose of a medication and it causes some kind of symptom. Um, the reason I'm not talking about toxicity is I can just make the blanket statement, don't take more of the medicine than you're told to take. Um, and then withdrawal. Some of the medicines that cause side effects of cognitive impairment can also cause cognitive impairment and withdrawal. And I'll talk about that as we get to them. So the sort of most notorious category is anticholinergics and antihistamines. And the reason this is notorious is that acetylcholine is known to be an important um, chemical in the brain for memory. In fact, people with Alzheimer disease and people with Lewy body disease, another kind of memory disorder, uh, both have pretty profound decreases in acetylcholine. And the treatments we use for those increase levels of acetylcholine in the brain. So when we have a medication that blocks acetylcholine, of course, we worry about the potential for cognitive impairment. And these medicines have been shown, have been shown to, uh, to uh, give you risk of cognitive impairment. So they're typically used for stomach upset, also used to treat insomnia and anxiety, particularly the antihistamines. Uh, they can be used also to reduce bladder spasms, so that people who may be incontinent or may be having to go to the bathroom very urgently or very frequently, we can reduce that frequency. And then they're used to treat uh, vertigo and motion sickness and other forms of dizziness. Besides the cognitive effects, um, you can also, with these medicines, get drowsiness and constipation, uh, dry mouth. So this is a list of some of the more common anticholinergics and antihistamines. See right at the top there, Benadryl, and then I put next to that Dash PM. So all these things, Advil PM, Tylenol PM, usually that PM is diphenhydramine, which is the same as Benadryl. A lot of people use these for sleep. 
A lot of people use Benadryl for allergies. Vistaril is another one that's used for sleep, anxiety, also used for allergies. Oxybutynin is another pretty common uh, anticholinergic medicine that's used for bladder spasms, um, detrol, and the others aren't as commonly used anymore. Maybe Antiverg, I've seen a few people come in recently on Antiverg. And then Phenergan is used quite a bit for nausea and vomiting. So all of these have the potential to block acetylcholine in the brain. That's, that's the way they work, they block acetylcholine. Now this graph on the right here, I don't know how easy it is to see, but the comparison here is between people who, in the blue, have never taken any anticholinergic medicine. In the green, people who have taken an anticholinergic medicine in the past for, for a sustained period of time. And in that other color, is that brown, purple, I don't know. But that third line, the, low, the steepest decline, is people who are currently on an anticholinergic. And what we're looking at there in terms of from left to right is their decline in cognitive status over time. The real key here is not so much that if you're on an anticholinergic, you may have worse cognition, may have more decline than someone who's not currently on an anticholinergic. The real surprise to people, to, to providers, was that people who had ever been on a sustained dose of anticholinergic had worse cognitive outcomes, even if they were no longer taking the anticholinergic. Yeah. What's considered sustained? Uh, in this study, I think it was six months, in this, the one that this graph is based on. There have been other studies with longer periods of time, looking at a year of routine, uh, routine, routinely taking. So it's important to know, this is routine at least once a day dosing. Someone who takes Benadryl, you know, three days a week because they have allergies, they wouldn't have been included in this sort of study. Um, other drugs that are not directly anticholinergic, in other words, they're not, that's not a part of their mechanism of action, but do have some anticholinergic properties. They are mostly in the psychiatric medication realm, and those include Elevil, Sinequan, Paxil, Zyprexa, and Hamilor. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are the most common. Um, and again, I want to stress, it doesn't mean I, I forbid that you take these, right. but if you have a cognitive problem and you're on one of these medications, think about seeking an alternative. Um, one of the ones that we see a lot of here is uh, people who are on Paxil for anxiety or depression. Um, if someone comes in with a cognitive problem and we see they're on Paxil, we generally will ask, you know, how long you've been taking it, whether it matches up with the timing of the cognitive problem, how much good has it been doing you, and in some situations where we see that maybe someone doesn't feel it's helping them that much, we try and switch it out. If someone says, I've tried coming off Paxil three times in the past 10 years, and every time I get incredible anxiety and depression, no other medicines we've tried have worked, but I'll come off it if you want me to, I say, I don't think I want you to. We will try some other things, and then we can readdress this later. But my goal is not to get you on or off a certain medication. My goal is to optimize your quality of life. And someone who is Albert Einstein level IQ, but depressed and anxious all the time, does not have a good quality of life. So again, there's a balancing act that goes on here. So another category is sedating medications, including the benzodiazepines. And the benzodiazepines you can recognize because they end with um, LAM or AM, clonazepam, diazepam. These are typically used for anxiety or for insomnia, a couple of other purposes too. They're occasionally still used to treat seizure disorders. They're used a lot to treat tremor as well. So their goal, I mean what they're intended to do is slow down brain function. Uh, so it's not shocking then that they might give you some trouble with thinking and with memory. Um, one thing that not a lot of people know is that these drugs are also directly amnestic, meaning that sometimes we use them to make people forget. And that is primarily in emergency rooms or in surgeries where people are undergoing anesthesia or undergoing some kind of traumatic procedure. We can actually give IV medications that will make them blank out for the period of time when they're going under anesthesia. Uh, so the reason I say that is, again, no surprise then that if you take these on a regular basis, sure. they could impair your memory. 
So again, some examples, uh, the benzodiazepines end with PAM, LAM, clonazepam, diazepam, that's clonopin, alprazolam is Xanax, diazepam is Valium, uh, Ativan also. Uh, barbiturates are really not used very much anymore, except to treat tremor or to treat seizures, not really used so much for anxiety anymore. And then there are these newer drugs that kind of act like the benzodiazepines, but aren't really benzodiazepines, Ambien and Lunesta, and those have also been shown to increase the risk of cognitive impairment. Oh, uh, I should mention also that so some of you, I don't want anybody to look at this and go home and stop their benzodiazepine because these drugs have very profound withdrawal side effects. So you really need to be tapered off. And withdrawing from these drugs, so if you have been taking a medication like one of these and you cut it in half and you notice that you're really confused, cloudy, it may be that you're suffering from withdrawal symptoms from that medication. Narcotics and opioids, this is in the news a lot lately. Everyone's heard about the opioid epidemic um, and how a lot of people are dying from overdoses of opioids. Well, that's not the only risk to these medications. Um, chronic use can impair thinking and cognition also. These really should be limited to use in people who have severe pain where other treatments haven't worked. So you really want to try other things before chronic opiates. Sometimes post-surgically, we have lots of experience that tells us that if someone has open heart surgery, that Tylenol and Advil probably aren't gonna work for that pain. So until they get some healing going on, we'll put them on an opiate. But that sometimes leads to people ending up chronically on these medications. And the biggest, the biggest thing here is to avoid chronic use if you can. Now I have patients, I just saw one, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before, who's on two opioid medications. Um, she has pretty severe back pain, and she's taking the medicines down as low as she can go. Do I think they're impairing her cognition? Absolutely. Do I tell her you can't take these anymore? Absolutely not, because she really does need them. She cannot function with that level of pain. So we reduce as much as we can this cognitive contribution and then we try whatever we can to enhance our cognition in other ways. <clears throat> steroids, not a lot of people know, chronic use of steroids is associated with a reduction in cognition. So for most people, this is going to be prednisone. Uh, dexamethasone is also used sometimes. Uh, but this is, this is chronic use, this is not short term use. Um, some people need them. Most people who are on steroids need them. Most doctors really do not like to prescribe steroids because they do have so many complications. But one that often isn't considered is the cognitive consideration. And now, um, you may have seen a lot of ads on TV for drugs that treat um, psoriasis. They call them biologicals, right? Um, now, for some of the conditions that we used to treat with steroids, we have different treatments. So if you've been on steroids for a long time and you're noticing cognitive problems, it may be worth just bringing up with your doctor whether any of these new treatments might be applicable to your case. The good thing about the steroids is that it seems that the cognitive problems caused by steroids are completely reversible. If you stop the steroids, then the cognitive pro your cognition will recover completely. Not necessarily the case as we saw with the anticholinergics, and now people are concerned that it might be a similar situation with benzodiazepines. But if you're on them for a long period of time at any point in your life, you may have an increased risk of cognitive impairment. Toxins are a pretty uncommon cause of memory loss, but wanted to bring up a few of them here because they might apply, you know, a lot of people have taken Pepto Bismol, for example. Not a lot, but some take it habitually. Pepto-Bismol contains bismuth, which is a toxin uh, to the brain. All of these, uh, you know, bismuth toxicity, manganese, toluene, and carbon monoxide, cognitive impairment will not be the only problem you'll see, and it won't be, it typically won't even be the most prominent symptom that you'll see. So these are included just in case, you know, someone has had cognitive problems and other symptoms and may have had one of these exposures. And then uh, medical conditions. Now, we all know 
that the only purpose of the body is to support and protect the brain, right? Cardiologists might disagree, but what do they know? <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the body is supplying blood to the brain, supplying oxygen, it's holding it up, the skull is protecting it, um, it's clearing away waste. So things that go wrong with the body, the body isn't functioning properly, it cannot provide the resources to the brain and clear away the waste from the brain that needs to occur. And there are so many medical conditions, right? I couldn't possibly make a list of medical conditions, but some of the sort of notorious and more common ones go over um, here. So in the United States and in a lot of Western countries, uh, cardiovascular disease is extremely common, whether it's high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, heart failure, and all of these uh, have in common that they have the potential to reduce the supply of blood to the brain. And, you know, blood, blood is necessary for carrying nutrients, for carrying immune cells to fight off infection. It's necessary for clearing away the base, waste from the brain. It's necessary for delivering oxygen to the brain. And if you reduce the supply of blood to the brain, um, there are likely to be problems. So, Pretty common condition is carotid stenosis. The carotid arteries are two big blood vessels in the neck that supply the, the bulk of the brain's blood supply. And it's fairly common for those arteries to get uh, constricted with plaque, building up of just grunge on the inside walls, which narrows the artery and reduces blood flow to the brain. And in fact, sometimes a clot will break off and block the artery and produce a stroke. Um, Heart disease, so even though the brain's way up here, the heart's down here, if the pump that sends the blood to the brain is not working well, then people can suffer um, the effects of reduced oxygen to reduced blood flow to the brain. Heart failure, similar thing. Hypertension or high blood pressure has a couple of effects. Um, very severe blood pressure actually causes leakage of fluid out of the blood vessels in the brain, and you can get something called hypertensive, high blood pressure, encephalopathy. Encephal is brain, apathy is disease, and people will lose their vision. Sometimes it'll be accompanied by headache. Uh, that is fortunately reversible, but hypertension has a couple, uh, another problem, which is it increases the risk for stroke. And also, people are thinking more and more that just having high blood pressure in some way changes the brain's ability to think right and to function properly. So it's very important to keep your blood pressure under good control. Atrial fibrillation uh, puts you at risk for sending clots to the brain that will cause strokes and cut off blood supply. But atrial fibrillation also seems to cause occlusion of small blood vessels in the brain. Uh, infections in the body can also affect the brain, syphilis, Lyme disease, and HIV AIDS. Uh, and immune diseases such as lupus and some rarer things like Sjogren's disease or sarcoid, sarcoidosis can also cause, uh, cause problems with thinking and memory. So fairly commonly we see people with diabetes, pretty common illness, and diabetes has direct effects on brain function. So the increases and decreases of blood sugar that occur with diabetes are more than the body is used to handling. Usually our body keeps blood glucose within a pretty tight range on a minute to minute basis. If any of you have diabetes, you probably know that typically the most frequently we check our blood sugar is four times a day. And so what you're doing with diabetes doesn't really match up what the body is used to doing in terms of checking and responding to levels of blood glucose. And the brain doesn't like that, doesn't like these fluctuations. Diabetes can also have long-term effects in terms of the blood vessels that go to the brain, causing occlusion of those vessels. Increases the risk for the carotid stenosis as well. Um, other metabolic problems, high or low calcium levels. Uh, liver disease, it's thought that the liver clears out toxins from the body and when the liver's not working well, uh, then more of these toxins build up and impair brain function. Similarly with renal disease, so people who are on dialysis <coughs> Uh, or people who have uh, advanced stage kidney disease will tend to also build up toxins that can affect brain function. And uh, then cancer, uh, of course a brain tumor will affect your memory and thinking, but some cancers can produce chemicals or hormones or antibodies that cause effects on brain function as well. 
And then there's the uh, increasingly recognized syndrome of chemo brain, where someone who has undergone therapy, chemotherapy for a cancer, develops cognitive clouding, um, difficulty with thinking, their memory's not as sharp as it used to be. Most of the time when we do neuropsychological testing, that's very detailed testing of memory and thinking, it's hard for us to pick anything up. But you just, you know, these people, there's definitely been a change. A similar phenomenon is after someone has undergone major surgery. So open heart surgery, major spine surgery, hip replacement, a lot of patients emerge from that feeling like their brain has changed and it's just not the way it used to be and it just won't come back. Now, we have a hard time sort of figuring out what this is. You do an MRI scan, you don't see anything, PET scan, nothing, neuropsychological testing, no evidence. But if you think about it, open heart surgery is essentially what you would have done to kill somebody 100 years ago, right? That was a fatal wound. Cutting open someone's hip and chopping out part of it and then hammering in a steel post, those are all things that I think we have very little experience with in human history because in the past, someone was dead after that. We don't really know how the brain responds to that kind of insult to the body. So is it shocking that some people end up with a change in their brain that's hard to describe and hard to test for? I, to me, it's not. The further away from... Bro, you can't ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, since you look so sad, go ahead. <laughs> That's a great question. I, I would say that it's, I mean, it may not be 50-50, but we definitely see in some people, I see in some people, that they do feel better as time goes on, very slowly feel better after chemo or after surgery. And some people, it just seems to persist. Don't see a lot of people with whom it gets worse. And if it does get worse, I get very concerned that it's something neurodegenerative. Again, Having one contribution does not make you immune from others. So I get concerned that something neurodegenerative may be going on. In fact, we have a lot of folks who present like that. You know, I had this, made this heart surgery three years ago. Yeah, I didn't feel right after that, but it was pretty much the same. But the last six months, I've been getting worse. I worry about those people. I don't ascribe that to post-surgery brain or chemo brain. So, um, with thinking about all of these potential contributions, especially if you saw any that apply to you or your loved ones, um, I want to again stress this. Don't run home and say, I'm not taking that clonazepam anymore, <laughs> or you need to stop taking your ditropan, I don't care where you pee. Um, you have to really think about balancing the quality of life issues. There is an important aspect of quality of life in cognition but there's also an important aspect of quality of life in the amount of pain that you're suffering or the amount of anxiety that you have. Um, but you do want to minimize the strain. So if someone's on a higher dose than they need of a medication, uh, try, and, try and reduce that dose. If someone's, you know, if you can't get someone to completely quit drinking, but if you can get them down to, uh, you know, just get them down to 14 drinks a week instead of 21. You know, you, you want to try and optimize as many things as you can. And optimization does not mean elimination or maximization. It means getting to a point of equilibrium that's satisfactory. Um, and pay attention to the big stuff. You know, a lot of people, there's been a lot of talk about statins and possibly causing cognitive impairment. And there is uh, data indicating that statins do cause cognitive impairments in a small percentage of people. It's reversible, so if you stop the statin, it will usually go away. If you switch to another statin, many people will tolerate that statin better. But people come in really worried about, Doc, I saw this thing about a Torvus statin, and um, it might be affecting my cognition, and the person doesn't exercise, they smoke, they don't take care of their diabetes. Pay attention to the big stuff, the stuff that we know has profound effects on cognition, and a lot of the things we talked about here are more fine-tuning. But exercise, good nutrition, staying socially active, staying mentally active, avoiding bad habits such as smoking and high fat, high sugar diets. Really focus on those and these other things again are, are fine tuning. And follow your doctor's advice, but don't you know, blindly follow it. If he says, you know, I think this medication would be good for you, 
um, you know, let's, let's take the case of ditropan for bladder spasms. If you're having bladder spasms, I think you should try ditropan. Have a plan for how you're going to uh, address that. The plan could be, no, I'm, I'm not taking ditropan, or the plan could be, okay, but can I get some cognitive testing now and some cognitive testing in six months to make sure it's not having an effect on me? How long do you think I'll need to take it? Or are there alternatives that we can do to the ditch repair? So, you know, don't absolutely veto things um, unless you know, you know, I took ditch repair five years ago and I ended up in the hospital. But um, the, the idea here is not to tell people, you know, what they should do, but just, just to give you some information about things to think about. Um, so in summary, there are, there are a lot of things that can cause cognitive decline other than neurodegenerative diseases. That being said, most of the time when we see someone with cognitive decline, a neurodegenerative disease is at least a contributor. Um, there may not be a perfect solution where you can get someone off of all the medicines that might be affecting them and you know, reverse their renal disease or liver disease that might be affecting their cognition. But the goal is to try and optimize, get to an optimal solution. And no matter what, again, pay attention to the big stuff. Um, exercise, diet, socialization, avoiding bad habits. And I think we have time for questions. Five minutes. Yes. Um, regarding um, the steroids, does it matter if it's an oral steroid or if it's injected like just a few times a year for like the end arthritis or um, plantar fasciitis. Did everyone hear the question? So this, that's a great question and this is, steroids can be absorbed to the rest of the body but this is primarily talking about A, chronic and B, systemic use of steroids. Injection of a steroid into a joint, often it will not go systematically. So we're talking about taking an oral daily dose of prednisone, not an injection, not injection say over a week for plantar fasciitis two or three times a year. Great question. Do you ever talk about trauma, uh, seizures? Mm -hmm. Do you have any effect? On cognitive? On, yeah, long term. So the question was about seizures and having an effect on long term cognition. Another great question. The jury is kind of still out about that. A lot of seizures come from the area of the brain called the hippocampus, a lot come from the frontal lobes. And some people feel that if seizures are left to just kind of go on for years and years, if someone has seizures over and over, that that may actually produce some damage to the brain. Um, other people say no, when we, so the reason that that came up is that you take at autopsy the brain of someone who had seizure and you look at the area of the brain that the seizures were coming from and there'd be scarring there and so forth. They said, oh, the seizures must have caused this scarring. But with more sophisticated methods uh, of looking at brains before people die, we're actually now able to detect scarring that we couldn't before, suggesting that maybe the scarring was the cause of the seizures and not the result. But you could have scarring that's there that causes seizures and then the seizures could cause more scarring, but that's very difficult to tell. So the jury's a little bit still out on that. But I would say that controlling it's seizures is a good idea. Interesting you said that, because 1985, I got in a car accident and they gave me EEG. The doctor says that I have a big um, uh, scar on the left side or right side of my brain. I said, what is that? She goes, it's like having one leg shorter than the other. Is, that, is there any? Scar in the it's hard to know what that meant by, I mean, the, they may have seen an area that either there was slowing or maybe some minor seizure. I mean, an EEG can't tell you whether there's scarring on the brain. It can tell you there's an area of the brain that's acting abnormally. But I didn't have much stress in what she said though. Well, I mean, she may have been using shorthand, but I don't know at this point what that shorthand meant in her case. Apparently there was something abnormal on your EEG. It was in a spot because she described it as a scar, but I, it's hard to say what that abnormality okay. was. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I think you had to come first. Uh, are brain scars typically caused by physical trauma or are there other causes of them? Everyone here, are brain scars typically caused by physical 
trauma or other causes. Lots of causes. Uh, just about anything that injures the brain can leave a scar. So, so like strokes, it does not have to be a physical injury. Strokes, multiple sclerosis, the plaques that they talk about are essentially scars on the brain. Uh, trauma, absolutely. Um, and sometimes people get scars in utero that we don't realize until something happens, they get a brain scan and we say, oh, look at that, you have a X, Y, or Z. That's funny, and, you know. I, I, I'm just kind of laughing at the way we tell patients things. Oh, you got a scar in your brain. <laughs> I mean, to me, that sounds a little scary. We say it like, you know, oh, your shoelace is on top. <laughs> yep. uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder, would they cause memory loss? Post-traumatic stress disorder causing memory loss. Yeah, a lot of people with post-traumatic stress disorder complain of memory loss. On testing, there is impaired, um, there is impaired memory in people with post-traumatic stress disorder. It doesn't usually slip to below normal, but you compare people to their peers or compare someone with PTSD who is having a lot of symptoms to when they're not having a lot of symptoms and they do have impairment in cognition. And thirdly, the first, I believe PTSD was the first condition in which they showed that the hippocampus can actually shrink in psychiatric illnesses. Well, I have a question about the B vitamin testing. Uh -huh. B vitamins being water soluble, how is it when you're testing levels that there isn't great fluctuation day to day in a water soluble? It's a great question. So the question is, you know, you're testing the levels of these vitamins that, based on their chemistry, um, there may be a lot of fluctuation from day to day. So we know for a fact that there is fluctuation. In fact, um, most neurologists advise that if you get a B, B12 level, for example, that's close to the lower limit of normal, that you should either repeat the test or get a couple of ancillary tests that can tell you about long-term B vitamin metabolism. Methylmalonic acid uh, is the, the primary one. So yes, they do fluctuate. They don't fluctuate so widely that someone with a high normal level could actually be abnormally low. But someone who is sort of on the borderline, you, you do want to worry and get additional tests. Is there any documentation that you're aware of with shift worker syndrome? Documentation? Shift worker? Oh, documentation with or shift worker else? syndrome? Yeah. Probably shift worker syndrome. So people who work unusual shifts, particularly shifts that force them to be awake at the time when typically and we would be sleeping. Um, I am not sure if there is clear documentation that we know sleep deprivation reduces attention and memory. What I don't know is if someone is a shift worker and they're getting their eight to 10 hours of sleep, does just those eight to 10 hours being at a different time cause an impairment? I honestly don't know the answer to that. Uh, actually, and I, I failed to put up here, I don't know how I missed this, but one of the medical problems that's kind of notorious for cognitive impairment is sleep apnea and sleep trouble in general. So I mentioned insomnia as part of the anxiety and depression, but sleep apnea is, uh, again, one of the criteria for diagnosing it is cognitive impairment. So people with sleep apnea typically would be very drowsy during the day, fall asleep unexpectedly, wake up feeling drowsy or wake up with a headache, and often there's a report of them snoring, at, snoring or stopping their breathing at night. And it's essentially caused by the throat being blocked off when you lie down and when your muscles relax while you're sleeping. So hold on, I want everyone to just listen for a minute. That is what your normal breathing should sound like. If your breathing doesn't sound like that at night, you should get evaluated for sleep apnea. Yes? Um, you mentioned before that you know, if you're taking certain medications or something to speak with a primary care and ask them, you know, in the long run, what kind of effect it can have in terms of the brain. Is it better to seek out a neurologist for that? Is it better to seek out a neurologist in terms of long-term effects of medication on the brain? Um, so neurologists may be more aware of the medicines that could cause cognitive impairment because if you don't have cognitive impairment, you're unlikely to show up at a neurologist, right? So from the primary care doctor standpoint, I put 100 people on Ditropan, a couple of them have cognitive impairment. From the neurologist standpoint, two people came to me today with cognitive impairment and both were on Ditropan, right? Yeah. 
So it might be it might be reasonable to ask a neurologist whether any medicines you're on are contributing could contribute to cognitive impairment currently or in the long term. But in terms of making the decision about what to do about that medication, if your primary care doctor started it, that's a conversation between you and the primary care. The primary care doctor is going to know what the alternatives are. They may say, "Listen, this is." This is the only thing that's available for this condition. I, I don't know all the things that are available for urinary incontinence. I know some of the ones that cause impairment, and I know some that we've been told are good to switch to because they don't. Okay, one last question. Uh, you said that some of the compression medications uh, can impair. How about the serotonin uptake inhibitors? The one of the reasons that the selective serotonin ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors became so popular is that for the most part, they lack anticholinergic and, ha and histaminic effects. So the older antidepressants, which were mostly tricyclics, uh, Elevil, Pamelor, um, Norpramin, those medications all have some degree of anticholinergic activity. The SSRIs, with the exception of Paxil, have negligible anticholinergic activity. And so people weren't getting those side effects. More importantly, these medicines were not fatal in overdose, and so they just exploded in popularity because of the commonness of depression and because the other medications were so burdensome and, and in some cases dangerous. Okay. Well, thanks very much for your attention and the fantastic question. <laughs>